But I think the main things is at the end of the day, volleyball is volleyball. It's in the same nine by nine court, and the rules are the same. So we. Uh, <laughs> is that on the back of your shirt? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's on the back of your shirt. You did, you did a little free shout out for you. Um, and it doesn't matter who's on the other side of the net. You need to still execute to the best of your ability if you want a chance to win. You know what, Rob? Every time I watch that clip, I'm always a little disappointed that I didn't have anything better to say than yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> because I was so excited that that's what he said, and I completely missed the mark on it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> welcome. It is Tuesday, July 19th. It is episode 35, and welcome to the 81 square meters of the best volleyball content on the internet, the 9x9. Nine nine. My name is Everett DeLorme, joined as always by Rob St. Clair from Chicago. He's repping the VLA t-shirt because the 2022 season just wrapped up this weekend. You know we're going to talk about that. But Rob, first and foremost, we have to talk about the absolute dominant performance by Paolo Agonu and the Italian women's team in the VNL finals this weekend. We're just going to jump right into it. Um, the USA loses out in the quarterfinals, surprisingly, to Serbia. And then it was just a clear path to gold there for Paolo Gonu uh, and Italy. What was it? 86 points? 87 points? For 83 first? points in 83 three matches points. for Paolo Gonu, the best player in the world and a well-deserved MVP of Volleyball Nations League as Italy sweeps Brazil. I mean, you just said it. The, the USA got bounced way early, and we'll talk about that later. But from that point on, Italy just they, – they, they had no opposition anywhere in that tournament. They were never really going to be challenged by China or Turkey in the semifinals. Or I was – the set scores against Brazil were all close, but Italy was the better team from first serve until last. And Oh, they controlled it. it. Oh, yeah. Oh, nonstop. It, it, was, it was their game throughout the entirety of the match. The only time that you saw – Italy looked uncomfortable whatsoever was in the third set when Brazil brought in the 18-year-old Anna Cristina in, and she was absolutely beasting uh, on the right side there. Um, but, yeah, they just they just controlled the tempo of that game so much. And if you look at the makeup of that team, it really doesn't surprise me. You've got skilled players everywhere. You've got quality players everywhere. I think the uh, that combination of Pietrini and Bozzetti on the left side is very, very underrated. Right, especially since you're, they're paired up with uh, Paolo Agonu, they've got one-on-ones all day. They can score out of system. They can do some good things, but that the entirety of makeup of that Italian team is just so, so, so good. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about Paolo Agonu, as you mentioned. Eighty-three points in only three matches. That's a redonkulous number. That's almost that's averaging. Weird. That's almost averaging thirty points. Thirty points per match. That's crazy. And her worst match of the three actually was the finals. Uh, 21 points on 18 for 42 with eight errors. That's a, a little under 25% efficiency. So definitely not her best performance. She did have three blocks, uh, which definitely helped. But it was that was kind of a matchup thing against Brazil because we know who Brazil's best player is. It's very clearly Gabi Guimaraes. And uh, that particular blocking matchup of those two soon-to-be teammates, uh, Igona versus Gabi, was pretty fun to watch. But you, I, I like the point you made about the outside hitters for Italy because the last couple of years, like we saw, we've seen Italy have success before. We've seen them crumble like at the Olympics last year before on the women's side. And there's the, the, the outside hitter position has been just a little bit unsettled is a word that I would use. We've had Miriam Silla in the mix for a while. She did not have a good club season at all. But I think that they, I think that they found something with the really different combo of Pietrini, who's finally healthy, which is great to see. Mm -hmm. Bigger, longer, more of a scorer. And then Bossetti, the complete opposite type of player, like kind of a Mikhail Kubiak player or, uh, I don't know, just your typical smaller outside who does everything well but you, but is going to be your third, maybe fourth option in the offense. That's a good combination of players. Plus, you've got Ana Danesi, Christina Kirikela in the middles. And I thought that Turkey might put up a fight against them in the, in the middle, at least in the semis. Uh, but against Brazil's middles, that was not really going to be a contest. And uh, Alessio Oro deserves credit there as well. They had a libero advantage with Monica De Gennaro over everyone else on the planet. You add that all up, and without the balance of the USA that we thought would be the only thing that could stand up against this Italian team on the other side of the bracket, with them losing early, Italy's tournament to lose, and congratulations to them. They got it done. 
Yeah, this the way that offense opens up with you have Oro, you've got Di Gennaro passing that ball, but really Paolo Gono, like we know she's she's the the jewel there. But everyone else picks up the slack. Like Danesi had a, a fantastic game. I thought Bozzetti was clutch in the end certain points. But just the way they control the pace of the play, right? They're so good on serve. They're so good on serve receive. Paolo Agonu can go out and make eight errors offensively and make errors from the baseline because everyone else is, is so controlled. And that's exactly what we're seeing on the other side of the net. You know, they'd, Brazil would stay tight and then they would start feeling that pressure and then Gabi would be making errors. And and uh, Nascimento would be, would be making errors and they would just kind of build on, whereas Italy was just steady throughout, just steady throughout. They've got the really, really good makeup of s- solid supporting players and one star. And I mean, they're not the most consistent team at times, right? They can kind of turn off and they can kind of lose some games and not be focused. But when the time is 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 there to win, they've got Paolo Agonu, they've got that roster and they, they have the ability to do it. And Rob, my question to you is, do you think the best team in the tournament won this tournament? Mm, that's a really good question. Certainly the best team this past week won the tournament. That's that's not a question at all. Like Italy was Italy clearly deserved to win this tournament with their performances past week, but uh, you're, you're clearly alluding to the USA and who dominated the preliminary rounds and we'll definitely talk about them a little bit. I I do want to address a point in the chat. Well, this Italian team has been playing together for a long time while half of Brazil starters are young. Yeah, I think Very that kind of goes I think that kind of goes without saying. Uh, we've been we've talked about this the really the entire VNL. Brazil on the women's side are currently dominated by Gabi on offense and then a whole lot of youth. Uh, we've seen Macris about half the tournament. Uh, we, they don't really have much of an opposite right now. They're they're getting some new middle blocker characters in there. Well, I, I would disagree with that. Like Kissy's all right, but I don't think Kissy's she's fine. In. But when when they brought in Anna Christina, she was something else. Like she is a massive presence. Yeah, on the six right for side. eleven, one like, error, and, 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 like and a she, set and a she, half. She only, yeah, exactly. She only came in, she came in off the bench in other sets, but she only really had an impact in that third set. And she was the only person, like, she's out there and she's physical. She's only 18 years old. So if she can continue to grow over the next couple of years, like, we might have kind of another player who's in that Hawk. Uh, Agon Agonu range, if not definitely in that in that secondary range of, of uh, opposites as well. Yeah, I'll say that's secondary range. And yeah, she's eighteen, got a long way to go. Uh, I, we, I have been throughout this tournament. I've been, I've been impressed by Julia Bergman, uh, who's got like a triple nationality thing going on. She plays at Georgia Tech in the NCAA, but is Brazilian. Uh, she was not very good in this match, three for thirteen with four errors. So uh, good tournament for her. She's only twenty one, but uh, much less good in the finals. Uh, Christina Kirikella on the Italian side. Listen to this for a middle blocker six for nine one error attacking two blocks and an ace and i'm pretty sure she had the the tournament winning stuff block at uh 25 22 in the third so i mean uh, did, as at the same time like that's how strong italy was down the middle because what kiri keller was six Denise, nine. Eight, eight for eight, eight. For eight. <laughs> exactly so they're just so they're so good and then down the middle and you have to know a it's the presser uh the presence of palo agonu because she just opens up everything everywhere else you're getting one-on-one looks because you know the the left side blocker on the opposite is always going to be fronting agonu and the middle is always a step towards her right but also alessia oro because right. that, this team is so good at ball control. They're so skilled. They're putting her on the net every single time. And she can just d- just dish it. She is, like, there's a few of those 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 swings for Agona where she's just looking at nothing. And she can just right. go go to town. And that's pure Alessia Oro. That's the, that's, the, that's the thing. Because Oro's best set is her 31 set. We saw it for Monza mm-hmm. this entire year. Her and Ana Danesi just destroying people. Spacing the offense out to the front like that. And it's, it's like classic. Once you start to understand... High, a little bit of high level volleyball spacing the first thing you learn is when you run the 31 in front of the setter you almost always have a one-on-one with your right side behind so when you have a setter and a lethal 31 combination in front and you have the best player in the world behind you don't have to make the offense any fancier than that because that will just just rip people apart if you can pass the ball so a uh, great matchup there and then oro executing that to perfection uh, let's put up just the, the score lines and a couple of the numbers from the final matches we've already been talking about them. Uh, do you want to shout out Ana Carolina da Silva? Um, Brazil's middle, her stats, six for eight, a block and an ace. Uh, I think she made the dream team. That was well-deserved, a good middle performance for her. But there's only so much you can do. There's really only so much you can do as a middle blocker against when you, against a, a quick middle attack oriented offense with two good options and then the best player in the world on the other side. Like That's uh, not an easy job. 
you could clearly tell that a they weren't getting enough of uh, production from Kissy on the right side, and also they were relying a lot on Gabby. Right, yeah, Kissy's, yeah. Kissy's pretty young as well. She's only a two thousand, right? So that makes her what, like twenty two at most. Um, and it, as we as we mentioned, like Julia uh, as well. How do you pronounce her last name again? Bergman. Oh, Berg. Yeah, Bergman. She's just Julia. Think... Oh yeah, Julia Bergman. Yeah, she's just Julia B here. Actually, I'm pretty sure her brother is an up rising rising up and rising star as well for the men's team as as, hmm. as well. Uh, I think she, yeah, she's got the, some some Brazilian, program. some German blood, and then also plays in the NCAA. It's, she's a global traveler for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I think right now you're just seeing a lot of youth, as our commentator said, uh, commenter uh, said in the chat there from from this Brazilian team. But do you think they have the potential to become a, a top team? Like right now, even though Brazil made it to the final, I don't see them as being as lethal as a team as Italy and the United States. If if there's a little bit of progression from these athletes, do you see them making that jump into that that top tier of teams? Maybe, but not this quad. Uh, no. I, I personally wouldn't pick them to medal at the Olympics in 2024. Uh, I, I think I think a silver medal at this VNL with this crew is a really good performance. Uh, they they definitely got helped out by not having to see the USA at all on that side of the bracket. But uh, this is like silver at VNL for a very young and uh, Brazilian or rebuilding Brazilian team. Good performance, and that, that's exactly what I was just about to put up. Uh, I'm glad somebody brought this up in chat. Brazil's problem is where are they going to put Ana Cristina? Are they going to put her at outside or opposite? And that's that's a that's a very fair question because across from Gabby, uh, Brazil's searching for that second outside. We've seen Pre de Roche, we've seen uh, Bergman, we've we could see Ana Cristina to the left, so you can put Kissy on the right, or I, I don't know. I, I don't really know what the answer is there. Uh, who who they mix and match where? So going into World Champs. With like a with a full strength USA, a full strength Italy, uh, Tiana Boscovic led Serbia. I wouldn't pick Brazil to medal at Worlds either, uh, just because they are so young. But they're going to get a lot of experience. They got a lot of experience from VNL, maybe overachieving a little. And this is Brazil we're talking about here. This is one of the great volleyball countries of all time. So uh, I'll never count them out. I just they're not in that like elite contender tier of women's teams right now that I would pick to win a tournament per se. Yeah, and I think we're going to have to see how it goes over the next couple of years. To be honest, I would rather see Anna Christina on the right, I believe. I'm not sold I on I agree. I'm I not agree. sold on Kissy. I do believe that she is the benefactor of a lot of just situational volleyball that br playing for Brazil opens up. Like, you know, with, when you're playing on a team that skilled, you know, you're going to get your looks. You're going to get your one-on-ones. You're going to get your opp opportunities to score, right? Right. But they really needed her and put a lot of pressure on her on the offense. And she just did, it wasn't great. She was 12 for 27 with four errors. Um, it, it, they're just not great, not, not great numbers for me. And I thought Anna Christina came in and made an immediate impact and was a physical presence on the floor. So I, I, I think that they're going to the, maybe they ride Berg, Bergman or, or whoever else on the on the right side and just have Gabby as your P1, figure out who that P2 is and then start feeding the, the monster that is that is Anna Christina. No. Yeah, and just to wrap things up for Italy on their side, they are very much a world championship contender. They're an Olympic 100%. contender. They're they're right they're right up there with the USA. They played the best volleyball this week, and they deserve to win this tournament. And when you have Paolo Goni, you always have a chance. But the I mean, we we've had such a good time following along with the Italian Women's League this past year since it was so much more accessible. We start to understand a much larger sample size of a lot of these players by now, but with all of them playing against one another in the Lega Folly Femenile this year, I was curious to see with all the options that they have, how they would put, how they would construct a starting seven on the floor. And I think the, this look, I, I like Oro over Malinov and I like the Petrini and uh, Bossetti yeah. combination. And then you've got two great middles and a great libero. So uh, this and none of them are really all that old. Christina Kirikel is 28. She's been around forever. Mm -hmm. um, how old is De Gennaro? She's 35. So this is probably her last quad. But she's, but I mean, you, you can play Libero at age 35, no problem, if you're as good as she is. Yeah. Everybody else on that team is like 28 or younger. Yeah. I mean, I remember being in club volleyball and my one of my coaches in like summer training was just like, you know who you should like when you're passing, he would put up videos of DiGennaro passing because he thought that she was just one of the best passers in the world and and, and she can continues to be. Uh, all right, that's that's wrapped up. That's everything now for the gold medal match. Let's move on to the bronze medal match. And now, Rob, Serbia takes home the bronze this year in the VNL. 
Neither you know or I had them uh, had them moving on past the quarterfinals, right? Let alone w- winning a medal whatsoever. Um, first of all, I mean, we're going to talk about that win over USA in a little bit. But first of all, how big is this win for Serbia over Turkey at home uh, without Tiana Boscovic? And on the flip side, how detrimental and how scared are you if you are a, a Turkey fan of the, at the moment, right? And let's like, like, you you have a team when you're playing against a team without their best player at home for medal at the VNL and you guys lose like that that's that has to be setting off alarm bells in in Istanbul and Ankara and elsewhere around Turkey dude you said it i mean serbia getting past the us was uh, it, it was it was an extreme surprise and so often when you see that crazy magnitude of an upset win the team who pulls it off like immediately fizzles out and just kind of lays down and dies the next round also we talked about on last week's show turkey at home playing for a medal it's difficult to get up for a bronze medal match uh but at usually if when that happens the home team just always 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 is the one with something to play for in that case uh like playing at home in front of a massive crowd I, i mean poland the Polish men in last year's European championships come to mind. They lose that heartbreaker to Slovenia in the semis, and then they destroy Serbia in the bronze match because they're playing at home. How on earth, if you're Turkey, do you lose at home for a medal to a Serbian team without Tiana Boscovic? How is that possible? Like, how do you, how do you allow that to happen to you? And I mean, 27, 25, 25, 17, 26, 24. Like, how do you get blown out in the second set at home with a medal on the line against a team without their entire offense. I'm just really confused by that. And to me, I mean, like Rob, you brought it up way earlier in the year when when we've, and it's been a constant thing. You can't go into a bronze medal match and only get 10 points out of your two outsides, right? So Noglu had five kills. And she went something for like like five for five for seventeen which negative efficiency for and then Shinolu, yeah. Baladin on the other Baladin on the other side three for twelve right with, with also a, negative with, efficiency with a, with a block and and an ace you can't have your like yes you can have your top score, score be your right side but even then Kara Kurt only fourteen points not fantastic out there but then your next two highest scores are Gunesh and, and Erdem like like. Character out, out there, fourteen for thirty-three, five faults. But like, you almost can't falter in that situation because how much of is of that is is gar are garbage balls? How many of those are out of system? Right when you, when you're serving in this system, how much respect are you are you putting on the left side of the court, or are you just bunching and you're just heavily heavily set up to to block the middles and you're he- heavily set up to, to to block the right side? Like Turkey needs to figure this out. I mean. I was way off at the beginning of this competition. I called them. I, I picked them to win it. I thought, hey, I like Turkey's progress over the over the past few years. They're hosting it at home. Let maybe they make this jump, right? Especially in, in a VNL year where you know the U.S. has has, has retired some players and you know all, all of these things. But man, overall, I would say that's very very disappointing for for Turkey and their fans to to lose in this one. I'm glad you brought up the point about the the effect that a lack of Turkey's outsides has on Serbia's game plan. And you better believe that Daniele Santarelli, of all people, is going to take that take an adv- advantage of that because you're right. He doesn't really have to waste blocking resources on either Baladin or Shinolu. It's like makes his job so easy. So you can load up Alexic and Stevanovic basically to commit on Gunesh and Erdem and then just t- totally send your right, your, your left side blockers to go and try and touch the ball on character. It's like a reverse trap block. It's very weird to play a team who lacks not one but two outside hitters. And so sure enough, Serbia undermanned. Um, we once again see the coaching matchup of Santarelli versus Gudetti, although on a very different stage this time. So uh, that's kind of fun. But uh, here's something for you, Everett. Since Giovanni Gudetti took over the Turkish women's national team, they have yet to win a gold medal at a tournament. None since uh, when was he hired? Uh, Ten major tournaments in six years. So wow. in Nations League, they've got a silver, a bronze, and then two fourth places. They've got uh, two bronze and a silver at Eurovolley, tenth at World Championships, and fifth at the Olympics. And this is supposed to be one of the best coaches in the world. Yeah, but at the same, same time, he just does like you know, he just doesn't have the horses to run with it, right? Like let let let's let's be honest here. Like I. 
this doesn't come but down to a, a you know Guidetti can game plan and do do anything like that but let's be honest like he's not control he's not in focused on development within the country of turkey right he's not the one who's out there working with the junior teams and youth teams to make sure that they have someone who's good enough to, to play on the, on the left side right like no matter how like like no matter how good you are on the right side, you still need your left sides to pass balls, to, to play out a system, to, to do all of that, right? Like the fact that they have gotten to all, all of those spots, like maybe the fifth place at the Olympics was a little bit disappointing, prob- probably the biggest of all of those. But I mean, how many top four results are they getting at the VNL? Like they're 100% solidified them, themselves. I mean, hey, like they got further than the than the US did. Like they, they were able to able to do that. I mean, opponent wise, like a, a little bit different, and they did lose to the same person, right? But they've gotten there. And 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 to me, the the mark of a bad coach is inconsistency, right? A team that can play out of their minds sometimes, but uh, at the same time can play terribly. I don't really see that from Turkey. Sure, they 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 had that one hiccup against Canada, but I'd like to say that was just how good we were and not how bad they were. But, and we're, and we're, and we're going to stick to that. But other than like, other than that, they're pretty consistent and they're consistently getting there. But at the end of the day, the athletes are the ones who are going to, going to get you there. The athletes are, are the ones who, who are going to be able to, to finish that execution. He can build the system. He can do all of those things, but if you don't have the horses to run it, right? Like, you know, you, you, you're not going to do it. Right? right. You know, the Avengers are only so good because of the super powers that all of those heroes have without those superpowers, They're just dorks in suits. Right. So it, <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't really matter what good Eddie does at the end of the day. Yeah. I, I think that's well said, but I mean, it's the opportunity that you had here to medal at home against Serbia without Tiana Boscovich and you get swept is, is crazy to me. Uh, Ana Bielica deserves credit. Uh, 11 for 31, six errors, not her best. Uh, on on the right side for Serbia, but she was really good against the U.S., which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, Lozo. Sara, Sara Lozo is really had, really had a coming out party. 18 for 29, two errors. That's above 50% efficiency and uh, gave Turkey an up-close and personal schooling on how to score points from the left side. Uh, Bianca Busha, pretty good as well. So, And then uh, their middles, who had an easier... It's not an easy matchup against Gunesh and Erdem, but the way that they, that they didn't have to worry about moving to their right as much helped them to at least hang around. And I'll, although Zara Gunesh five stuff blocks in three sets, that's that's pretty awesome. Yeah, but they, um, they need like Turkey needs her to do that. They oh yeah, need her yeah, to totally. be putting up that that kind of numbers to stay relevant because especially if you don't have outsides, yeah. like I would love to see the numbers on on their side out efficiency rate. Like I believe it's probably amongst the lowest in, on these teams because they do they do gain points, like they do steal a lot of points with their blocks and their serving uh, quite a bit. So I'd be very interested to see kind of how efficient how efficient they are in in the side in the side out uh, in their side out game in general. Hey, listen to this number. You want to know Turkey's team efficiency uh, attacking in the bronze medal match? Yes. 189 as oh a team. Goodness. 37 for 95 with 19 errors. 189. <laughs> Compare that to uh, 287 for Serbia without Tiana Boscovic. See, one and of my balanced in blocking and, and serving because that that should be I would perceive that to be one of Turkey's strengths is blocking and serving and uh, nine blocks to 10, three aces to two. So balanced yeah. there. Serbia's offense infinitely better. That's the match. That's it. Yeah, 100 percent. Now, for all of this, I would be I am very interested to see how this Serbian dynamic is once you bring back Tiana Boscovich into the fold. Because how many times have we seen it? Like, let's go back to Lynn Sanity. You know, Mello's out. <laughs> you bring in some random dude. And then all of a sudden, this team is galvanized because they're working together. Everyone understands that, hey, the star is out. I need to go 5, 10, maybe 15% a little bit harder, a little bit further, a little bit more. And we're going to come together and we're going to do do this together. Does that still work once you bring Tiana Boscovich into the fold in 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 uh in the fall once you get into the world championships that's what someone thing i'm going to be interested to see about the serbian team but still if you're a serbian like fan right now you have to be very very happy right. with yeah. what's going on I, I like that reach of a take adding the adding a uh, top two or three opposite in the world back and does your team get worse uh, the answer is no because uh, the players that were that were galvanized and improved were not opposites uh it was really lozo and busha and then the middles and so like they didn't really get that much out of Bielitsa, especially not in the bronze match. So all you need to do at that point is reinsert 
one of the best opposites in the world and clearly the best player on your team. And all of a sudden, Serbia looks like a real, real contender. I mean, remember, they've won the last two world championships. So uh, they've, they've got a they've got a three-peat opportunity coming up this year, dude. Yeah, that's that's a little bit scary uh, how they're they're gearing up to that. And they still have to add Boscovich. And once again, I didn't say they were going to get worse. I just said <laughs> I'm interested to see how their team dynamic is. You're the one who's reaching out here with these uh, with this these also, slanderous remarks. My bad. Serbia has not won the last two. They won the last one. Uh, in yeah. Okay. In Serbia or the, the yeah, U.S. won in 2014. The, yeah. The U.S. beat China in, in, in 2014. We both we both should know that. Yeah. Um, well, Rob, I think that's it's it's time now to bring up the most disappointing team oh we're gonna almost we, yeah, yeah we, we got we've, we've dream talked dream about team. all these we've talked about all these players now individually but we do uh got to talk about the dream team uh gabby for brazil obviously and uh, our anna carolina in the middle for brazil uh well deserved there um stavanovic for serbia is is a nice little honor i would have liked to see one of the italian middles get recognition but they had so many other italian players in this lineup that i, I understand why you couldn't give the entire thing um, to the Italians, a De Gennaro, Libero, no brainer. Oro at setter, pretty much a no brainer. Uh, Bassetti at outside hitter, I'm a little surprised by, but I understand that her value is more than her numbers. And then Egonu, obviously, it was a slam dunk. So uh, that's your dream team. I'm always interested in like the distribution of players. Like if you win, you get four. If you're second, you only get two. If you get bronze, you get one, and that's kind of it. But uh, that's your dream team. So whatever. Uh, it's always kind of a an afterthought of VNL with these individual awards especially since it's limited to that exact breakdown that you know yeah. like we're not going to see Britt Herbots who who led the tournament in scoring in this right and you would have to argue that the t- high score in the, the the tournament right should should be there so yeah it's 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 a nice nod i guess and it's but it's basically just for, just for the finals and uh, yeah pretty yeah. much Congra- congratulations to all, to all of these and one one team you won't be seeing any of the players on uh, is the USA because they lost in a shocking fashion uh, in the quarterfinals. Going down 0-2, it looked like they were going to pull off the reverse sweep and then just came out flat in, in, the, in that fifth set. It looked like there was a few moments where they were going to push through and that they were going to be able to pull off the comeback, but Serbia just stayed stayed strong and went for it. Oof. Uh, yeah, we... You and I both, Everett, on last week's show, this we didn't even talk about this match because we were so certain that it would the drama would only start like in the semifinals with the U.S. taking on Brazil or whatever. We both were talking about a potential USA dynasty, and uh, that got thrown back in our faces pretty quick. Like I, I'm a, I'm American, obviously. I'm a huge fan of the USA women's team. I'm not like quite as emotionally attached to them as I am to the men's team, though. So I can definitely uh, poke some holes where they need to be poked and. The first and most prominent position group of holes to be poked is very clearly outside hitter. Uh, Catherine Plummer with a terrible, legitimately terrible performance. Uh, Kelsey Robinson was okay. Uh, She did lead us in scoring, but not very efficient at all. A 17 for 39 with eight errors. Uh, That's a lot low efficiency. Uh, Allie Franti came in, played well. Uh, 14 for 22 with three errors is is 50% of efficiency. But we were all watching in the Discord, Everett. Uh, plug for the Volleyball Source Discord if you haven't already joined it. The link's in the description. But we all saw it in the Discord. We, we were all watching. We all saw. We, we saw how Plummer was performing earlier in that early in that match, immediately passing like trash, immediately making hitting errors, immediately just not really in her game. And the fact that she stayed on the court through almost all of the second set uh, everyone watching the Discord was pulling their hair out, yelling at Karch Karai. Like, how could you? How could you not recognize the type of performance you were going to get out of her that day and put her on the bench immediately? It was crazy. You know what? I'm even questioning why she was there at all in the first place. And now, to be honest, as much as I'm, because I also picked the U.S. to to win here, I do feel a little bit vindicated. Uh, now, I was was talking about in the earlier in the year about how. A, 
My biggest worry about the USA is that they didn't have a go-to player. They didn't have that one all-star player that can get them through in a moment. And, you know, if you look at, at Serbia, like Lozo's your guy, or sorry, your woman, I apologize, your girl. Like she had 22 points in this one. She wasn't great offensively, but like put up like, was it there four blocks and three serves, three aces, something like that. Like she's Huge. out, she's out there. They're putting points and you know that she can put the team on her back when when it matters but when i look at this american team you've got a lot of either i'm not going to say b level because they're not b level they're a level but they're not a plus level right if you look at this roster how many of these these american athletes are the best player for one of the best teams in the club in their club leagues literally none of them right they're all nice pieces and this is the exact same thing that that what you're seeing seeing to it now my other thing was everyone's response was answer was you have Catherine Plummer and I had one absolute idiot in the comment section of one of our old videos who went off on me and was like oh Everett doesn't watch volleyball do you not watch Plummer no 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 but get with it I do watch Plummer and guess what she's been breaking down in these scenarios go back and look at every single one of Conigliano's losses this past year Plummer was always a bag of of dog crap. She was always terrible from the serve receive, from offensively. She just falls apart in these scenarios. Now, overall, she didn't even have uh, an exceptionally good like regular regular round for them. Like she was like their sixth or seventh best attacker, right? She only scored over 20 like over like double digits like twice. She had a 20 point game and an 18 point game. Like she was by like not even close to being one of their best players. You have Bayama who's back at home and and could have been been there probably watching on the couch watching her struggle being like yes like this this is a good thing because like like one two three four five six seven like Catherine Plummer was the seventh highest score for the, for the USA she's not being brought for her passing ability so what was she doing there right it, it, there's there's such a there's such a reliance for this USA team on the team game and I think when you have a fantastic team game and you play an even style volleyball like that. You're going to win more games. You're going to be Japan, basically, on the men's side. You're going to win a lot of games in the, in the pool play because you're going to stay really, really consistent. But at the end of the day, players win championships, right? Superstars win championships. And I don't know if there's one on the, this USA team right now. Yeah, there's a lot of that that I agree with. And there's we saw last year at the Olympic Games that sure enough in in the game of women's volleyball which in many cases is dominated by one or two ultimate superstars uh Egonu for Italy obviously Boscovich for Serbia um Brazil last year won Olympic silver uh, a little bit more of a team based game but like sure enough the the, the storyline was can a true team of the USA which is much much greater than the sum of its parts get it done over all of those superstars that stood in their way the answer was yes now this time the the lack of leadership and experience at the at definitely at least at the outside hitter position but just in general uh really showed up to me I, it was it was interesting i think that justine wong arantes was the most like vocal leader sort of character as, as we were listening in timeouts as uh just the vibe they didn't have Jordan Larson. They didn't have Michelle Barch Hackley. They didn't have Faluka Akin Rodwell. They didn't have that player who had gone through that grind and gone through that disappointment and then put it all together. They, they like you're right about Plummer. I think there, there's a, a real weakness there in, in big situations. But I mean, just independent of the numbers, there wasn't somebody who stepped up to me for that USA team and tried to really take control. Of the of the game, or take control of the team's personality, or any of that, and there just there wasn't any of that. Uh, we we brought it back in the third set with just a ridiculous blocking performance. Uh, Twenty one team blocks in the match is uh, one of the highest numbers I've ever seen. But it was the, the in the fifth set in the fifth set of a tournament game like this in the finals of VNL against a team that you should beat. You need that one player to galvanize your team, to bring everybody together who has been there before and knows what to say, who to say it to, when to say it, and we didn't really have that. And then there was a weird string of points in the fifth set where we got behind, just couldn't bring it back. That was kind of it. So there was, there I was, was also one more thing. I was confused about the substitution of 
any Drews in for Jordan Thompson. I didn't think that Thompson was all that bad. Um, nine for 17, three errors, two stuff blocks in like two sets. I get that you just kind of got to change something up at that point, but I don't think that was yeah, the Gordon issue. Larson. That's what you need to try to change up. Yeah, yeah, you needed that that sort of a player. And, and Allie Franti was did played extremely well in her role coming off the bench, but that that move needed to be made significantly earlier so that you can adapt to that new combination of players and get that thing done in the fifth set. It just didn't happen. Yeah, the, the, that was like the other the other questionable call was like if Jordan Thompson was rolling, it was fine. I don't know why you you take off Annie Drews. And I mean, Ali Franti did do great, but like another another example of performing, uh, you know, crapping under cracking under pressure. We have someone say in the comments that she missed a dig. It wasn't at thirteen thirteen. It was twelve uh thirteen twelve for Serbia, and you know the ball was right there. It was on a long rally. It was right in front of her. Uh, and she missed that dig that made it made it match point Serbia at 14 12 she makes that dig maybe they win that point that game turns around but right there it was clear that just that inexperience in that moment kind of kind of shut her down so I'm very interested to see how you know Karch has done so well at, and there's also also one other thing that we have to bring up too is the fact that Lauren Carlini has set for this team the entire tournament almost right she has been the one who's been running in this team and then they went with with Jordan Poulter Poulter in this one and I know she is quote unquote that number one that number one starter but at some point did Karts not think about throwing in Carlini even for a little bit just to see if the dynamic would be a little bit different well I mean he, it took him so long to figure out that they needed to put Plummer on the bench there was no way he was making a setter change. And, and I respect that. I, I respect sticking with your starting setter. I think I think that was the right move. Uh, the opposite move confused me a little bit, but really, like, it's kind of like you've talked about it, Everett. Sometimes you you see an early an early couple point sequence from Nick Hogue for the Canadian men's team that you just kind of know that that particular day he's just not going to be your guy. And more often than not, he is your guy. But when you see those couple early signs, you need to get him out of there pretty darn quick. It was the exact same thing for Plummer. All of us watching from a distance could see it. We saw it almost immediately like, okay, we, we know what kind of Plummer we're going to get here. This is not going to go well for the U.S., especially – in a matchup against a Serbian team who served and blocked extremely, extremely well and picked on her relentlessly in reception. Once you realize that, you got to get her out of there. That took too long, cost us at least one set, probably two, and that might have been the difference. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, we 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 brought up Santorelli against Guidetti earlier, but do you think, Rob, that Karch is falling behind the rest of international coaches because he's not coaching professionally, right? We see Santorelli, we see Guadetti, who are dealing with these athletes on a year-round basis, right? He's they're, they're always there. They're always around him. They're always under that pressure. And volleyball is a quickly evolving game, not only kind of in the styles of play and and, and how we do it, but just the athletes who are coming up, uh, coming up and coming through. Is Karch missing out on some of that experience by not coaching professionally and just staying in the u.s in the off season actually that that's i i respect that take i i do think it's a reach considering we lost 15 13 in the fifth uh in a playoff game but i i it's a it's an interesting question of what is the best strategy for managing not just your players but your coaches because a lot of these european coaches will coach elite level club and, and then take up a national team job uh, i actually like that Karch doesn't coach club. Uh, I, I I really like it, especially because he doesn't have a superstar. Like it's it's not nearly as easy for the U.S. as it, as it is for a team like Italy, for example, who all play together ish in the same league and who have a Paolo going to like superstar to throw that together in the gym at the beginning of national team season and figure it out and like reach uh, like ninety percent of their level in like a week. That's a lot easier for a team like that. The team, a team like the USA, can never, ever, ever do that because it's built completely differently. So I like that Karch has the entire club season to plan and to observe from afar and to strategize and just and and to work on the youth pipeline. I think that's good, and it's something that I wish that John Spira would do. Uh, I, I got some some fun insider info that uh, because Spira coaches at UCLA during the season. Um, he showed up this VNL and didn't know who Camille Semenyuk was. They're like, wait, who's who's this guy? I hear he's pretty good, and but he's so like in, in his own world for nine months out of the year that he that he because he's not coaching club, he's coaching university. He misses out on 
things that are going on around the world. So I'm I'm totally okay with how Karch is spending his time. I would like to see Sparrow maybe take some notes and pick one of the two. All right, fair, fair enough. I I, I I can respect that answer. Um, but overall, Rob, are you worried going into the World Championships, leading up to the World Championships, about this American team? Nope, I think it's going to be the exact same question as it was last year at the Olympics. It's can a, a team that is attempting to be greater than the sum of its parts, not dominated by one superstar, can it get past a couple of those superstars along the way? If we run into Serbia with Boscovic, what's going to happen? If we run into uh, Italy with Egoni, what's going to happen? If we run into even Turkey with a great Karakurt that day, what's going to happen? I, th- I think we win that match because of the, the outside hitter weakness, but... Uh, Italy and Serbia are really, really scary matchups. And w- without that left side experience that we got used to the last quad or two, uh, it's going to, it's certain, it's not even close to a foregone conclusion that the USA is going to win that tournament, if not even medal. I mean, this particular group were the favorites to medal, couldn't get past the round of eight. The world championships format is certainly no easier. Uh, actually, it's more difficult because you get put in the round of 16 in the world champs and it's single elimination from there on out. So uh, medal like that. Is it for the women's? Is it for oh, the yeah. women's? Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. same format for both. Six pools of four, um, top 16, straight I'm, bracket from there I'm, on out. That's it. I'm pretty sure, no, I'm pretty sure the women's is, is the is the other way around. I was looking at Canada's schedule before and they have six first uh, first round games because they, they have to play two in, two in uh, the Netherlands and then three three in Lodz. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure from what the research I was doing just just last night was that oh, the, the men's right. and, and women's is 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 different formats. And the yeah, only reason right. they did the men's format as it is was because of the last minute minute change change for you're Russia. Right. I'm, I'm looking but, at it right now. But that women's, makes it women's is four pools of six, and then there's that stupid pointless second round, and then the bracket is only eight teams. Okay, you're right. My apologies. I assumed like any reasonable person that they would run the two tournaments the same way for the men like and the any women. Any reasonable person, exactly. <laughs> but it it also makes sense too when you like they've they had already announced like host city schedules dates and stuff like that for the women's and there's no effect there because of the war right so you're not going to take that away from from all, from all of that so you can you can understand why they 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 did it the way they did. Yeah. I mean, well, what i'm saying is i'm giving the fivb a pass this time guys <laughs> not gonna happen again uh yeah we'll talk obviously a lot more about world championships as that tournament comes up in a couple months but yeah i think that just about wraps it up for vnl uh really good tournament really well, really, really good tournament i do ha- do ha- i do have one more question for you yeah sure right at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of this event, you were, you know, very, uh, very confident that Catherine Plummer was kind of one of the solutions for Team USA. Are you still confident in that? And if not, who do you think deserves a shot? I think you still have to start her and Kelsey Robinson. I still think that's the correct two players but you've got to have a better eye and a more accurate read on the pulse of plumber that day i think that her her leash the the length of her leash needs to be a constant assessment for this usa team and like it really like it was for corneliano where they would just replace her with megan courtney uh in club when they needed somebody who could pass the ball speaking of which why isn't megan courtney in the mix on the national team that's kind of another question but uh, she's, I, bears, she's basically a Katarina Bozzetti, right? Like she can pass, she can, she can pl- maybe not as good offensively, but she's she got, type she got player. relegated to, to the libero position from the USA years ago uh, before like the rise of Justine Wong Arantes and never was able to break out of there. And now there's other outside who's younger than her, but I mean, Courtney plays for the best, the second best club team in the world this past year. So I don't know why you don't bring her in. Anyway, I, yeah, I, I would still continue to start Plummer. I think the attacking ceiling is really high there and is the right um, primary scoring option that you need when she's on, but you've got to really be on the pulse of how long her lease should be. Yeah, um, absolutely. When she's there, she's there, but sometimes she can be really not there, and, and you're going to need to pull her, for sure. Agreed. All right, so before we jump... Uh, anything else about women's VNL, Everett, before we jump into uh, a couple messages and then men's VNL finals? No, I think that's it. I mean, I think it, it was great. It, it was fun to watch. Um, yeah, g- good stuff. Can't wait for World Champs. It's going to be a good one. Totally. 
All right, so uh, real quick, let's run through these because the people who listen every week are aware, but we have to shout out, first and foremost, uh, thatvolleyball.store. If you're interested in that sweet baseball tee that Everett's got right there with the spicy volleyball logo on it, or uh, I, I want to get a spicy volleyball hat. That hat there in the graphic looks awfully sweet. Uh, you got some 9 by 9 merch if you want to rep the, the best volleyball podcast on the planet. You got Make Volleyball Great, the crew neck in red, which is really good. The water bottle, uh, you got stickers. I got a... I see volleyball sticker here on the back of my laptop. Any of that stuff and more uh, live on that volleyball.store. The store is live now. And uh, Everett, I think we mentioned we were going to talk to uh, talk to the Discord and see if we can get some people to uh, make a little bit of art for us and sell some merch out of it. So uh, if we're definitely going to do that. And if you're interested in that, definitely join the Discord. But... You don't even need to be in the Discord. Hey, if you if you have That's something, be like, hey, I have a I have a t shirt idea or something. Um, just shoot us a message, DM us on Instagram, you know, let, let us know because, uh, we'd love to have it. I've, I've been working on a few designs, Rob. Um, I think, I think you might like a couple. Of them. Okay. Okay. I'm looking we'll forward see. to it. We'll see if it's it got a, a picture of you standing up and singing the American national anthem on it, I'm buying it and wearing it everywhere. <laughs> I mean, I think we can make that happen. Right. <laughs> Oh, we, awesome. we have we have we have the technology we have the technology <laughs> so yeah check out that volleyball dot store uh for a bunch of good uh spicy volleyball merchandise and a bunch of other good stuff that kicks back and helps support the show uh speaking of supporting the show uh everett tell the people about bet us another way to support this show is by logging on to bet us and using the code volley one two five when you make your deposit if you want to go you can just check out the link just below here to to uh bring you over there now when you use this code volley one two five it's going to give you a 125 percent deposit bonus which means you deposit a hundred dollars you're going to get 225 it's literally free money now it's the heat of the summer as we've talked about there's mlb going on right now there's tons of golf going on right now um there's volleyball going on right there's now. beach volleyball going on yeah. you know everywhere so make sure you guys head over to bet us they've been around since 1994 that's why they're called america's favorite sports book and use the called code 125 for 125 percent deposit bonus Yep, Volley125, that helps us kick back to the show, so definitely uh, hit that up if you're interested in some sports betting, and uh, jump in the Discord, because we've got a whole channel dedicated to it, where Johnny Boy posts his, his lines, the matchup that he likes, and then uh, roasts himself for his bad picks. It's always a good time to catch up with that. So, uh, Everett, now with women's VNL uh, done and dusted, we shift our focus to the men. Uh, getting going tomorrow, which I'm just so, so excited about, is uh, the final eight of men's VNL from Bologna, Italy. Uh, the first two quarterfinals, we, uh, kicking it off, uh, we've got uh, the, the matchup that I'm for personally looking forward to the most, the 3-6 matchup between the United States and Brazil. That's uh, Wednesday, July 20th at noon Eastern. That's tomorrow if you're listening to this live. Yep. And then uh, after that, you got the host Italy taking on Namir Abdelaziz by himself. Uh, in the form of the Netherlands. <laughs> oh, come on. Give some respect to some of those other nope, guys, man. I won't. You, you and I both know that that team is, is that is the, that is a one player team, and I will not hear arguments otherwise. Uh, that Italy, uh, Italy's beatdown of Numeria Abdelaziz will take place at 3 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. And then uh, the next day, two matches that are both extremely spicy. Uh, France taking on Japan at noon on Thursday, and Poland taking on Iran at 3 p.m. on Thursday. Wow. Is is it not weird to you that like I would like to see like the same side of the bracket playing on the same day? You know, yeah, I, I would know they too. have, a, I, know they have a, I know they have that. a day of off in between, but now the U.S. You know, like whatever. Um, but yeah, you know what we I talked about it a little bit last week that I really like these quarterfinal matchups. Yeah, each me too. each each of them has a little bit of intrigue in it. Um, and I think like the only one that I think is not going to be great is going to be the italy netherlands one and i still think that's going to be pretty fun to watch namir just go up against italy and, and to, to see how how that works because at the end of the day he's got nothing to lose right so i'm i'm expecting he's just going to be bombs away so that one should be fun but man the other three usa for brazil classic classic rivalry poland iran i mean that one's become a really really good one over the past few years Those and let's remember hate each other iran beat poland in 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 the uh, group phase right so poland has something something to prove out there in poland that was like in, two weeks ago yeah in, yeah exactly in poland and then on the last one there france versus japan i think their styles match up so intrigued this is going to be such a highly skilled match you've got some of the most explosive players in the world there i'm i'm like thinking i need to get rid of my shift on thursday at work 
so I can stay home and and watch the the, the second game here uh, on Thursday because these matches are going to be unreal and I see. Hey, spicy, you, you, spicy. You, you know who's back in the mix for France that really might make all the difference in the world? Genia Grabenikov. Finally. Uh, Jenny Grabenikov, the best libero on the planet, is back. He is going to be making his VNL debut for France in the finals. So that lineup of you know either setter, you got Jean Patry, you got Chinese and Legoff, you got Inga Pet and either Cleveno or Loati, and then you got you got the goat. You got you got Grabenikov back there. That team that team could easily go out and win this tournament. And the particular matchup against Japan is going to be just so much fun to watch you're exactly right so skilled that's going to be one of the more entertaining matches regardless of result because of the number of highlight real defensive plays that are probably going to be made yeah I'm, I'm, I'm unbelievable i mean i can just picture it just guys jumping out of the back row and setting on two or, or, or going on two <laughs> just consistently yeah, two best teams in the world at that by far 100 percent right so um but at the end of the day it's really going to be about what i you know we talked about it before the japanese team is you're always going to know more or less with what they're going to bring right and it's whether or not you can handle that and for a lot of teams they can't because they bring so much speed they bring so much skill they bring so much so much from the baseline but this french team i think if any team can handle this japanese team it's the french team because it's almost an upgraded more physical more athletic version of japan I think you lose a little bit in skill, but realistically, not that much. This team passes so well. They play defense so well. Their setters are fantastic. You know, the fact that they've done this well without Grabenikov just 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 says it all. Um, and uh, shout out to Benjamin Diaz, who's played really well this game. I've been really absolutely. impressed by him. We, 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 we got to see him firsthand in Ottawa. I mean, fuck, right. that feels so long ago now, right? <laughs> Doesn't it, dude? <laughs> it, uh, it feels like almost, uh, almost, almost a lifetime ago. Dude, trust me. I'll be at the bar some nights just hating my life and like dreaming back to Ottawa. Uh, um, but yeah, like I think like this, this French team is a serious contender to win it. I don't have them winning it. However, I do think that they're a serious contender, t- contender to win it at all right now. Yeah, I, I actually do have them winning it. We'll get to our okay. picks in a minute. But, uh, I mean, you, you said it. it. The closest thing to Japan that's not Japan is France in terms of just pure off skill level. And then they're about six inches taller on average at every position. Uh, I cannot wait to see Barkley Machin and Yeze's stat line after this match. <laughs> this man is going to feast on people. Especially the way that he plays too. He's so malleable and he he has such a large window to play and his arms are so long. I can just see him causing trouble. And not to mention like Chin and Yeze like has like he played with Ishikawa this year, right? That's so he point. has he has that familiarity from playing with him with him at, at Milano. I was going to really say that he's a smart blocker too. Such a so, smart blocker. So so smart. I was going to say he played with Nishida as well, but no, they just played at Vibo at, in 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 separate years. But um, yeah, and I mean, hey, like I think we have to talk about this American uh, versus Brazil showdown. Um, I'll say it now. I have the USA in five. I don't think it's going to be as easy as it was the last time time around. But I do think the USA is going to be able to pull this one out. Okay, yeah. The, the the when the USA and Brazil last played, it was week one. I remember we were in Ottawa, like looking down at scores, and I was looking at wait a minute, losing our minds. The USA played an entire B team and beat Brazil in Brazil in a sweep like that. That didn't make any sense. So yeah, it absolutely will be a lot more difficult this time around. Um, this match will more so. I mean, this, this is true of every volleyball match, but more so than any serve and pass. For sure. Uh, Brazil can be a vicious serving team. If you've got Leal, Lucarelli, Darlin Souza, uh, even you know Bruno sometimes, if you've got those guys serving and you've got Aaron Russell on a bit of a shaky passy day, trouble. But if you can if if we can serve as well as we have for, for the most part in VNL, which has been a pleasant surprise and a big reason why uh, we're in the finals and not uh, missing the playoffs like last year at the Olympics with a million service errors. If we can serve that well, and if we can take Yoandi Leal out of the game, uh, past that, we've learned in this tournament that Brazil is extremely thin on the left side. So if we can um, pull a drag on Travitsa and get Yoandi Leal's head and get him uh, out of the mix a little bit, then I think we've got a great chance there as well because we match up <laughs> decently well everywhere else i mean getting we're getting into some some risky territory there rob uh, <laughs> bringing that situation up again but you know what i'm more interested in watching brazil's offense 
because yeah. to me, it's that's kind of where they've really been struggling, which is crazy to say because it's Brazil and we're we're expect they're expected to have such a, a tight knit offense. But I'm excited. Like, is Leal going to be the guy? How is Darlin Souza going to do on the right side? You know, they they just seem to be kind of crumbling and losing a little bit of their their identity. And the scary thing for me, Rob, when I look at this Brazilian team, when I look at the women's team. They're having success with a very young team, with with players coming up, but also you've got Gabi, who's arguably like you could you could make a case that Gabi's a top three outside at the moment. And in, in, she's in the best the outside world. in the world. Okay, she's yeah, the best exactly. Outside in the world. I, I mean, yeah. hey, I'm I'm glad you, I'm glad you agree because that's what I was thinking as well. Oh, totally. But then, but then on top of that, you have all of these young players like we we literally just talked about coming up underneath. I don't see the same thing on the men's side, right? And the men's team has been dominated. I, I see right? a lot of age on the men's side. Exactly. And the, 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 the men's team has just been dominated by this older age. And I mean, like, how, like, one of the best young um, Brazilian kids coming up is from Canada, who grew up playing club volleyball in Canada. Now, Who's that? Oh, our Arthur Bento. Don't even get me started on how we let him just how he, we let him just walk his butt down to Brazil. And I mean, he is Brazilian. His mom played beach volleyball for Brazil. Like he is a like I'm sure he has a Brazilian passport, and that's why he has that ability. But literally, he went to Volleyball Canada, and they're like, "We want to play for Canada. How do we get him on the national team? How do we, you know, how do we work with the national team?" They said, "You're too young." So he went to Brazil, and now he's playing for them. This is a different story that I. Don't really want to talk about right now, but all to I say, didn't know this. Oh wow. yeah, oh yeah. It's 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 something that eats away at me. It's something anyway. that eats away at me. Absolutely. Anyways, um, yeah. As I said, like I this 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 older generation of Brazilian volleyball has just had such a stranglehold on them for so long that they haven't had anyone come up, right? Like even Campacho, who's the next guy up for setting, we haven't really seen him much. Like yeah, we we see him for Sada Cruzeiro. But otherwise, like when's the last time we really saw him for Brazil? Can he do what what Bruno did? And I'm, I'm really starting to question: Is are we going to see a mediocre Brazil leading into the next quad? Right? We know what they have now, and we know that they're good enough to be a medal team. But what do they have past that? Yeah, I and I don't know the answer because I don't watch the Brazilian league as much. And in a tournament like VNL, which is of all the places, the place that you probably should give your younger guys a lot of looks. But Brazil, for one reason or another, has always been the team that pretty much, or the Brazilian men anyway, pretty much play the starters all the time in VNL. Uh, for better or for worse, I mean, they did win the tournament last year with that strategy, but are, w- what is that going to produce in like 2025 is, is exactly the question that you're asking, and I totally agree with you. So i um, curious to see that match. I, I really do think it's going to come down heavily to serving and passing. So uh, we don't need to talk about Italy versus Netherlands that much. I do want to talk about Poland versus Iran, though, because, mm-hmm. you, like you said, big rivalry. I mean, no Mikhail Kubiak and Maruf anymore, who really got into some fun uh, yelling matches between the net a couple years ago. But Iran went to Poland and beat him in five just a couple weeks ago out of just nowhere. And Iran has been a hugely meteoric rising team since a like shaky week one of VNL. They've been terrific since. Really deserve this playoff spot like we talked about last week. Uh, we've got Amin. Uh, Amin Esmailjad is his name. The lefty uh, on the right side. If you haven't seen him yet, you will. Uh, Esfandiar is a young, big, good left side prospect. Uh, Milad Ibadapur obviously playing against Poland where he's played club forever. Uh, the I don't see them getting past Poland again with this much on the line. I think Poland just kind of didn't get off the bus that day, but the it's, it's as good of a two seven matchup as we could have asked for. And by coincidence on the two seven matchup on the women's side, uh, the seven seed one that was Serbia over the USA. Yeah. I, I think that's sorry, to be honest, I got completely distracted. Someone in the comments was just like a word or two about Irvin Engapet's Instagram. Oh, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. We'll get there. We'll get I was, there. I was, I was look, I was looking that up, but uh, we'll yeah, there. I agree. Uh, so Poland rolling in with the boys. Uh, no surprise there. Uh, I, I think we might as well get to our picks Everett. Uh, yeah, I think it's time for that. Hit me with, hit me with all of your picks. Give me your quarterfinals. Give me your semifinals and give me your medal matches. Round one. I've got Italy over the Netherlands. Um, I've got France over Japan. I've got the USA over Brazil in five. Uh, and then I've got, I think Poland's going to sweep Iran. Uh, I think they're going to come in with a vengeance and just go after them. Um, Kurek is going to be like 
kill mode Kirak. I, I, yeah, Kirak does not like Iran. He's, no, he's going to do some crazy things to that team. A- absolutely not. Like he's going to be beast mode Kirak. Once we get to the semis, um, sorry, Rob, I think I'm actually going to pick Italy over the USA. Italy um, doesn't play the USA. It's it, it'll, it would be Italy and France on your side. Of oh the crap! Well, then that that was completely wrong because I thought that the same same side. So then, just on a whim here, Italy versus France. Ooh. I'm going to have to give that one uh, to France. I think that Italy is, is the better team, uh, or sorry, France is, is the better team in, in that case. Uh, I was going to pick um, fr- or, uh, Italy over the USA. Um, I think that they're just a little bit more skilled than they're going to be playing at home. However, I'm going to pick France over Italy because that is not only a team that is very, very skilled, but you've got all those players who are used to playing in Italy and they also like kind of being the villains, right? Like they kind of they like kind being, of do. They kind, they kind of like do. being the dicks of volleyball, and I love it, right? So I think, yeah, me too. I, right? Like, and let, let's be honest, like this is going down in Bologna, which is down the road from Modena, and as, as we'll we'll talk about in, er, er, Engapeth's uh, Instagram story. So you know, Engapeth is going to go want out there and ball. You know, the Grabenikov is going to go want want to go out there and ball, right? So this team's going to going to come to play in that other uh, semifinal semifinal. I do think that Poland's going to take down uh, the USA. I think this Polish team is just way too skilled and and they've got got everyone uh, going on it. And in the finals, I'm picking what the semifinal was in my other bracket bef- before I knew what was going on. I'm picking uh, Poland over France 3-2. For- okay, five setter for the final. Uh, I love that. How about uh I don't know, USA Italy for bronze. You got to pick there. Ooh, USA Italy for bronze. Um once again, I'm going to go with the home team. I think the home team will be able to pull it out for bronze at home. Fair enough. Yeah, I wouldn't be that mad with a 3-1, though. 3-1. Okay. All right, we'll take that. So uh, my picks are going to be pretty similar. Uh, I've definitely got Italy over the Netherlands. I've definitely got France over Japan. I've definitely got Poland over Iran. However, uh, that, that leaves one matchup that I actually don't agree with you, Everett. I'm going to pick against my own country. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pick Brazil over the USA. Now, whole the oh, reason... Oh. Here's the, oh. really um, this is just this is just a meta play here because as you'll recall, uh, back in week one of VNL, I was extremely down on my country, who to whom I'm extremely emotionally attached. I thought that they might go zero and four with the roster that they sent down there, and sure enough, they walked in with the B team, came out four and zero. So I think I'm just gonna kind of once again go for the reverse jinx and pick the USA to lose in the first round, so that they hopefully. Um, do the opposite and win and can at least play for a medal. But I am going to, I am going to pick Brazil. Um, then in the second rounds, I am going to pick France over Italy, just like you did. I'm going to, I'm going to call that going to five and I'm going to pick Poland over Brazil. So I have the same final as you, uh, but I think that France will beat Poland in the final. Uh, I think that th- there's, there's just because of what we've just learned in the last day or two, this French team has maybe even more of a chip on its shoulder than, it would have otherwise. And now they don't really have anything to prove. They won the Olympics last year, but now I think they're coming into this tournament a little bit pissed off. And not to mention, they've got Gianni at the helm, right? Right. So you've got like, not only an Italian, but an Italian legend. Who I think, I got to say, I think Gianni kind of feels in general slighted by Italian volleyball because he's, He's like been he, Germany. His the, the men's job in Germany, eh, mediocre job. French team, great job. But I think, how can you be Italian and not want to coach the Italian senior team? Plus, like the sort of the, some of the drama he went through with Modena this past year, being right back there in Modena this week. I think there's, I think there's a, a little bit of extra sauce in this French team that we might we might not have expected. I'm really really enjoying. It's really too bad that Antigua is no longer coaching on the men's side and coaching internationally because I'm really enjoying how we've got this previous generation's superstars who are now coaching and at the top of the game. Like To me, that battle between Gerbich and Gianni at the head of those teams is so interesting and so if we had awesome. if we had antigua in there as well and that that brief blip he had with canada like just bringing in another guy who who was a legend like i don't know maybe vlajli vlajli or, or some way is going to step up on on the polish side and and kind of be one of one you of got, their you got coach coaching germany and okay yeah vinyars but Vinyarski isn't at the same level really in my eyes as like gianni and and gerbich like those are two fair enough you know superstar yeah. guys like those that's in like 
the all-time greats. You know, Winiarski was very good, but he he's not at that level, right? So I'm really liking that dynamic where I'm sure that there's a lot of respect for each other. Um and yeah, I'm very I'm just very interested to see yeah. how, how how those team if if it's a Poland versus France final, I mean, hey, we got to see Poland versus France in Ottawa firsthand. I'm pretty sure you commentated it, right? So like I would love to see that again in the final when there's something on the line. That would be a blast and could easily be a world championship finals preview. I mean, there's this this men's tournament is pretty stacked. I mean, other than the Netherlands, who I think are just kind of a pleasant surprise and uh, should be happy to be here because their best players are ridiculously good. But these other seven teams are all like legitimately really, really good. And that even includes Iran, who kind of came out of nowhere. There's going to be some really good volleyball played. So it starts tomorrow. Uh, I'm really hyped about this. You can watch all the games on Volleyball World TV. Uh, join the Discord as well. We'll be chatting about them for sure. We might be able to hook you up with some some alternative links, so to speak. So um before we move off vnl everett and wrap up the show we do have to address what was alluded to in the chat and that is irvin ingapet has been the most forward voice about this issue but the iranian federation the entire F- french federation and the polish federation and, and then a lot of their individual players have come out in the last day or two and have just been brutally roasting the Italian Volleyball Federation for some of the conditions that are happening in Bologna right now. And the tournament hasn't even started yet, but uh, from this, this is reported well on World of Volley. Uh, Worldofvolley.com is a good news source. Go check that out. But yeah, Irvin Ingapet's Instagram stories were very, very scathing. And he did like a video tour of the practice gym that looked like it looks like Cuba tier facilities. Like, yeah, legitimately. I... it looked terrible. And Irvin had a, a message verbatim. He said, come on, volleyball world. We know you don't care about us players, but at least like put in a little bit of effort for this, for this final or something to that effect. Then there was a video of um, the, the teams literally sitting on the floor in a hotel room with this terrible buffet worth of food after they weren't fed when they got there that was the iranian and polish federation's complaint they literally didn't have food provided for them and then there was a video of uh, from inga pet and boyer in a hotel room with beds that might have even been worse than the cardboard ones we saw in tokyo at the olympics like the conditions in bologna for the vnl finals look bad bad and this is and this is italy we're talking about here this is a country with volleyball infrastructure this, and this wasn't like it was a, a last-minute rescheduling because of the, Rus- the Russian war in Ukraine. It's, it's not because of that. This is just like who is hosting the finals. I'm really surprised to see the Italian Federation pull like a, a USA-tier move in being miserable at organizing this event so far. Very strange. Yeah, really, really, really interesting to see what, what's going on with all this. And I mean, the the, the story that I saw too from Ingapeth about how they were renting their own cars and driving to Modena. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And Modena, <laughs> which is, funny. of course, is you know that Pedrini is just like, oh, you've got Irvin and uh, Grabenikov Gianni. and Gianni there. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> Come down. We're going to be your savers. Blast our logo everywhere. Everyone knows that Modena is, is great. But yeah, it's... um. You know what? As at the end of the day, it's um, it's hard to see, but it's almost to be expected at this point. You know the the and the reality is is that for the FIVB, the focus is more on how they treat the VIPs and not so much the players. Like it is absolutely ridiculous that this is how we treat the best players in in, in the world, especially since like when's the last time they got a day off, really. When's the last time they got a month off? Like it, it it's going to come down to the reality is why this was sport doesn't grow is because of crap like this. Exactly. It's it, when we talk about it all the time on the show. To reiterate again, we are firmly, firmly in the corner of the players on all issues related to this. We talked about Bruno earlier in the tournament. Just roasting the FIVB for the schedule that, that they, they play year round uh, it resulted in the injury to Alan Souza like we we agree with the players and we support them 100% on stuff like this some of the videos that were coming out especially from a superstar like Irvin Ingepet I'm glad he documented those things Love and I'm it. glad he put them on display because they, it, that from a player like that who the FIVB makes so much money off of th- of all players to maybe get them to open their ears to to the, some of the issues the players are bringing up, it might be Irvin. 
I wouldn't expect there to actually be any positive change to come from this. That would be very out of character. But yeah. I'm glad this stuff was brought up. It is not good. Go, go look it up for yourselves. You guys go to worldofvolley.com and some of the, the other pieces of media that have been shared about this. The conditions are rough. Yeah. Like the, the first thing I saw about it actually was Eric Shoji and Micah Christensen posted a video of them warming up in this exact same gym in 100%. Bologna. And I, did you see it? I was looking at it like, wait, where are they right now? Yeah, they, they weren't saying anything about the conditions. It was just a great... No, they weren't, but I, but I but I I took notice. Like, it popped I had the off same, the screen to me. I had the same thought, too. Yeah. And I was just kind of like, you know what? Like, at least they got some Terraflex down there. But, yeah, it looks like a, a bad high school gym. Like, it looks like a community gym uh, that just 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 isn't, isn't a great look. I mean, you've oh. got so many fantastic facilities in Italy. Why aren't we using them? Ugh. FIVB... Like show up, man. Like, come on. Yeah, be, figure be it better. out. I know we. I know we said did a, you know we gave you a pass something earlier, but we're not giving you a pass in this. No, one. no, this, um, this one's an excuse. Re, real quick, Rob, because I was just on World Volley and we brought up a situation earlier between Leal and Travica. Travica, do you know that Travica is now <laughs> suing uh, Leal and Engapeth for that whole situation? I heard about this. <laughs> yeah, I heard about this. Oh, what a what a ridiculous story. Yeah, we'll have to get get back to that on a, a show where we don't have so much PNL to talk about because of how stupid that is. Yeah. Well, so like once once we know a little bit more, all we know right, is right, right. So there's nothing really to talk about. I just I think I, since we brought it up earlier, I thought we had to bring it up because yeah, yeah. it was pretty funny. I saw Def- that headline. Def- definitely interesting. Uh, but all yeah, right, all, but- all right. Is that is that it? Is that it from V for VNL stuff? Yep. So the schedule pretty simple. Two matches tomorrow on Wednesday. Uh, two matches on Thursday. Those are the quarterfinals. Uh, no matches Friday. Then both semis on Saturday and both met medal matches on Sunday. They're all at like decently North American friendly times in the middle of the day. So uh, awesome. no problems there. They were a little early when they were in Turkey. I think that the Italy match tomorrow is at like 9 p.m. local time. It's weird. It's pretty late. No, but uh, it, it, is it, is, it is nice for us on the western half of the world. So uh, join the Discord. We'll be talking all about it. Uh, last but not least, ever before we wrap up the show, uh, it, it wasn't just Italy winning a tournament or winning a season-long championship this past weekend in uh, this very T-shirt here in the Volleyball League of America, um, men's professional volleyball in the States. We handed out some hardware this weekend as well, and it was Team LVC, the, the New York Legion Volleyball Club, the Team LVC, the Pink Flamingos, that walked away with their first VLA championship, 3-1 uh, to one in the finals in Chicago over the hometown team and two-time defending champion Chicago Icemen. Uh, this match was sick. This match was so good. If you haven't gotten to watch it yet, the match has got like 3,000 views already. Uh, it's going to keep growing. Go back and watch it. Uh, it's on YouTube on the VLA channel for free. Really good broadcast. Match was outstanding. These were like clearly the two best teams in the league, at least in Tier 1 this year for sure. Uh, Nicolas Scherzen played was phenomenal. Uh, you had the, the middle blocker duo of Blake Leeson and Mike Marshman for LVC, who are both pros. Uh, Joby Ramos and Sunil Thomas setting against each other one-on-one, which are two elite, like, professional caliber setters. Uh, there was some really, really good ball played. Really entertaining. So I highly recommend going to check this one back out. Uh, Boston Bounce and Team Pineapple finished tied for third. Uh, SoCal Rising tied fifth. Uh, Phoenix Ascension sixth. So that's it. That's it for the VLA season. We've got a couple months off to plan some more bigger and better things for 2023 but yeah i really really recommend people go back and check this match out it was really really solid fun way to wrap up the season i really liked the graphics that you guys used kind of early on um the production overall looked pretty friggin' good the yeah baseline, 1440p 60 frames per second that baseline angle is just so sexy um the side angle that you guys use too for like in between points is is great as well nice and low um i think one thing next year is you guys need some banners and some branding on that back wall you know we we, we need, yeah we, we, I, need, I actually we need... tried to put a couple up and we uh we tried to like tape up a couple banners that kept falling down didn't have a scissor lift or anything yeah yeah we, we would like to make the the in arena aspect a, a little bit more energetic uh, that's, that's something like we had a decent crowd on hand here in chicago where i live my home city but it was a they were a, they were a little sleepy for a really good match in the finals. I was a little disappointed by that. I wanted a little more energy, so uh, we, we've got work to do on like producing the energy in the arena. But as far as the broadcast went, uh, I was pretty stoked. Looked pretty damn good. Looked pretty damn good. I was uh, watching a little bit of it on uh, when was it Sunday night when I got home from work. It was kind of my my uh, 
come down watch video and yeah it, it looked very good it's just more and more like even though you didn't have the moving baseline camera like you did for the tier two championships obviously space was was a restriction there yeah it you was. couldn't you couldn't get a man camera back there it still looks good and it just leads more and more credence to like how like going from watching vla from the baseline to watching vnl from the sideline just sucks like it, it really does it, it, especially it, yeah the, the camera quality too being now we're able to get it to be just about the same and uh broadcast in 60 fps from the baseline uh we've got a pretty so good so yeah smooth. we've got a pretty pretty compelling product going on over here so yeah check out and support the vla if you don't already that that final match really was extremely good it was there was a fun moment and like in the third set you see set scores there uh 25 18 this was ridiculously competitive throughout, but there was a there were a couple calls, um, two two uh, no calls, one one on a block touch that Nikolas Scherzin in the third set really did not like, and he went back to the line shortly thereafter and ripped off like five points in a row with three aces. And after every ace, he was looking at the other side of the net, going like this, as if to signal like you know that ball was touched, you should have called that. Uh, it was kind of spicy, so. Uh, that was really fun, and we had we had a, we had a great time this weekend. So, congrats to Team LVC, their first uh, VLA championship win. Who won the after party? Uh, LVC very clearly did. Okay, fair enough, w- without question. And well, was w- was it better or worse than the VNL after party? Uh, nothing will ever compare to the VNL after party <laughs> for reasons that you guys will never know. Never, <laughs> never know. <laughs> Never, ever. <laughs> well, boys and girls, uh, I think that'll about do it for the show. Thanks for watching. Uh, it's been fun uh, watching, following with v- women's VNL this entire tournament. Congrats again to Italy. Uh, same thing on the men's side starting tomorrow. We're going to crown a champion on Sunday, and we will be right back next Tuesday to break that all down. Uh, Everett, have a good week of volleyball watching, my friend. Everyone, join the Discord. We'll be chatting along with everything in there, and uh, we'll see you next Tuesday, same time, same place. Buy some birch from that volleyball.store. Go. Peace.